Welcome to the Ringer NBA Show. I'm Chris Vernon. Joining me as he does every Tuesday from TheRinger.com is Kevin O'Connor, a.k.a. Kevin O'Bomber, a.k.a. Kevin O'Concert, a.k.a. Kevin O'Conflict. Kevin! <laughs> Birdo! How are you doing this morning? A very rare night last night where we did not have any NBA games on, but we did have the NCAA National Championship game, of which I am sure you are keenly aware. Yes. That Villanova team was absolutely devastating throughout the NCAA tournament. They won their games by, I believe, over 17 points per game by the end. And, of course, won that game last night by that margin. They were, I mean, I, I, I tweeted this out last night. Much like we have seen NBA basketball evolve, I really believe that, that we're going to look back and that that Villanova team changed a lot about the way college basketball was played, especially three-pointers attempted. Because when I went and pulled it last night, I want to say they were seventh in the country, and most everybody around them were smaller schools, and certainly not like blue blood schools by any means. And I bet you next year, much like we have seen in the NBA these last couple of years, you will see a massive uptick in threes attempted and college basketball is going to start looking more and more like what the NBA does right now. What do you think? Certainly a possibility. Last night we saw Villanova take 27 of their 57 shots for threes. So that's nearly half. And like the Houston Rockets right. this year in the NBA do take 51.1% of their shots from three, like just over half. Uh, so Villanova certainly does run what it resembles an NBA offense, which made last night's game especially especially exciting to watch. And the guy who took advantage of that, Chris, Dante DiVincenzo. Unbelievable performance by him. Yeah, for your purposes, you know, because I know you spend a lot of time evaluating players for an upcoming NBA draft. For your purposes, does them being able to, it doesn't it feel like evaluation might be able to get a little bit easier if college more mirrored what the NBA looks like? Because that's been one of the real challenges, right? With so many of these cases, how does it translate to the next level? I mean, I would obviously love for more of the things to be adopted. Um, obviously the line is shorter, but especially defensive three seconds. If I could have anything, that would be the thing that I would take out of college basketball that would help with evaluation for the next level, I would think, in terms of driving lanes, in terms of guys not being able to just stand right in front of the stupid basket. But, you know, don't you think that if Villan- if more teams started looking like Villanova, maybe the evaluation process gets a little bit easier? That struck me last night. Maybe, uh, but also maybe not because the, the skill level just isn't close to on par as uh, NBA basketball. I understand. But, you know, I think, you know, moving the three-point line out to the NBA distance would help. You know, adding defensive three-second violations to make teams run less zone, that would help as well. But it's a shot clock as well. There's There's a long list of things, really. Here's all I'm saying. I'm watching Villanova last night, and I think you can watch those guys. This is just me. I watch those guys, and I I don't think it's hard to see how some of them fit within an NBA offense. And I think that is difficult with other guys that play maybe more an antiquated style. That's all. Totally feel you. Totally feel you. I think you can look at a handful of guys on that roster and and imagine them playing for an NBA team. I mean, not just Mikhail Bridges, the lottery picker, Jalen Brunson, the point guard, but like you said with Dante DiVincenzo, or even a guy like Spellman at forward, versatile player, the way they use him, shooting threes, not just having him be a bruiser inside, even though he's like 250 pounds. Some offenses just as easily could turn him into just a bruising guy down low, but Villanova's like, no, we, we play a modern style. And they emphasize that with the guys that they recruit and then the guy, how they develop their players and then how they use them on the court. DiVincenzo might have played his way into getting drafted. Seriously. I wonder what he'll do because I didn't have exact rankings, but I had him lumped into the second round. The court, Nobody really thought mm-hmm. he would ever declare. I mean, he only scored 13 points per game this season. He's only a sophomore after redshirting for his freshman season. So he's a redshirt sophomore. He had a gigantic, unbelievable performance. I don't know if it's enough for him to declare. I think he should go back for one more season with an increased role. Brunson will be gone. Bridges will be gone. Yes. Um, There'll be more opportunity for him. And then maybe in a weaker draft next year, we're talking about him as a first round pick. But I'm just saying in the future, no, he's not going to be. He wouldn't get drafted in the first round, therefore getting a guaranteed contract. 
but he's majorly on the radar now. Yeah, he, I mean, he deserves an opportunity right. for sure with his shooting ability and his his athleticism, um, and even his playmaking too. Uh, he didn't really show it quite as much last night uh, with three assists to four turnovers, but over the course of the tournament, the entire season, he has some playmaking skill as well. One more thing on that uh, Villanova and the possible prospects. I was listening to the podcast that you did with Bill Simmons and Chris Ryan, and you, and you had mentioned Jalen Brunson uh, during one of the bits. And you're talking about how he is, you know, uh, late first rounder, early second rounder. I know Charks just wrote an article about him for The Ringer. And here's what I'm saying. You remember last week when I challenged the whole idea of why the hell do we worship these where everybody says these players should go, right? And I'm not, I'm not busting you up here, but you said late first round, early second round, right? For him. Why? I look at it and I go, all right, we know that people have passed over these guys over time, whether it's guys that were these players of the year. And I could just rattle them off. Uh, Draymond Green was player of the year in his conference. Jay Crowder was player of the year in his conference. Chandler Parsons was player of the year in his conference. You have seen, uh, Malcolm Brogdon was player of the year in his conference. Frankie Mason was national player of the year. And like over and over again, we see these guys that are like, in the end, we say, boy, they should have been taken ahead of a lot of guys that were taken ahead of them. And I'm not saying that you should be taking Jalen Brunson as a lottery pick, <laughs> but I do think we look at it and we go, all right, every year over and over, like usually those guys aren't overdrafted. And I'm not saying that it's a prerequisite or that it's a guarantee that if you are a player of the year in a conference or a big conference, that you're going to be good on the next level. But I just rattled off quite a few that by any estimation, if we redid the drafts, would be taken much higher than they were. So why is Brunson any different? Why are we not learning our lesson and somebody's still going to wait until the late first, early second before he comes off the board, possibly? I mean, saying late first round, early second is really just a way, you know, for me to, I guess, capture, hey, here's where he might be drafted. So, like, if you're a fan of a team with the 24th pick, then, you know, oh, maybe he's a guy that I might think about at that range. Because, I mean, he's not going to go lottery. Uh, that would be stunning if he did. Even top 20, I think, would be a little bit of a surprise just because there are limitations. I think we saw a little bit of it last night with his ability to create off the dribble. He's a really awesome college player. NBA-wise, I mean, what is he going to be? Will he be a... I mean, the comparisons we have for him in the 2018 NBA Draft Guide are Mark Jackson, I believe, Luke Ridenauer. Uh, I think Andre Miller might be the third one on there. I think he's going to be a really good pro. And he might be exactly, as you said, Chris, the type of guy who falls too low. But I don't think I'd draft him super high just because of the success of some past national players of the year. There's also been bad ones. Tyler Hansborough, uh, who's like not bad, but average players or a guy like Frank Mason last year, good quality NBA player, went low, but not a guy you would take in the lottery. Trey Burke was a national player of the year, and it's taken him quite a while to really figure anything out in the NBA at all. But there's been a lot of great national players of the year that have had long, successful NBA careers, and I think Brunson will be one of them. But I don't know if you'd take him very high in the draft, though. I just look at him, and this is the difference in philosophies on the draft, right? I guess I turn a little bit of a cynical eye towards all the comps and everybody's going to be amazing. And I look at it. I do too. I'm with you. I'm with you. I just look at it from the other end, which is, you know, draft failures. It's because you draft guys that can't play. You draft guys that can't cut it in the NBA. And I am 100% positive that kid can cut it. It's just a matter of how good he's going to be. Right. But he's not going to suck. There's no No, way. He's not. (laughs) Right. So he's he's not. not. So, and you know how many guys get drafted that suck? Right. So like whenever I do come out with my draft guide, it is going to be (laughs) I'm just I'm I'm not even going to make it as a mock draft. I'm not even going to my draft guide is just going to be guys that I know are not going to suck. And so if your team takes these guys, (laughs) be happy. Maybe their ceiling is a little bit lower, but their floor is way higher than a lot of guys that are going to get drafted ahead of them. Well, that's what you have to weigh, right? So if if you're drafting for for just a general team, you have to weigh, are you going to take a guy that you think projects in all likelihood of being an average to above average to good player? Are you going to take him over a guy that you think probably has great upside but also has a chance to suck? Like, are you going to take Jalen Brunson 
over Shea Gilgis Alexander? I don't think so. I think Shea Gilgis Alexander being one year younger has displayed the the traits of a player with more significantly higher upside. Are you going to take Jalen Brunson over an eighteen year old kid like Anthony Simons? Um, I don't think so because Simons has displayed the upside to be a, a far significant more player. Whereas then with Brunson, like last night, he kind of disappeared at times. That that that's really the concern with him, where it's like he just projects as more of a role player. He's gonna have. He nights. disappeared because he was on the damn bench yeah. with four fouls. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> but my point is, is that he projects as more of a role player. Where he's gonna have some of those yeah. nights. So it's like, yeah, those guys are gonna fall because that's the strongest likelihood outcome for him. Whereas you, some of the guys are gonna go ahead of him. Yes, yeah, some of them are gonna suck, but then some of them are gonna end up just as good as Brunson. They're gonna end up role players just like him too. They're just younger, or some of them are gonna end up into being far superior. And if you take a role player ahead of some of those guys, you'll end up looking silly. I think when you get to that point in the draft, I mean, the odds are the odds are usually that you're not even going to get a guy with a long career. You know what I'm saying? In the late first round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking from yeah. 20 to... If you get a good player from 20 to 30, somebody that's on the roster past his rookie contract and you sign to another one, you hit as far as I'm concerned. Sure. The thing is, with this year's draft, like there's probably a I don't want to say the word consensus, but it's kind of a consensus. There's a top group of like 12, 13 guys, order them however way you want. It's different for everybody. But then after that, you have another lump, right? And and the key is for teams in those ranges to figure out which of those next 20 or so guys have the best chance of being a steal. Jalen mm-hmm. Brunson might be a steal in the sense that, like, yeah, you got a good quality player who can, who can have a long, successful career in the NBA, but he might not be a guy who's just a big hit who changes your franchise. And the goal for a lot of teams is to find that guy from that group. And I don't think it's Brunson. He's a good player, though. It's all about philosophy and what you're looking for. If, like you, if you need a backup point guard and you have no cap space, but you have like the 28th pick in the draft or the 34th pick, Jalen Brunson's your dude because you're drafting for need and he can fill a hole immediately and do it, do it successfully. But if you're a team where it's like, we need everything or we already have everything and we need to take a swing, then you're going to take that higher upside guy. I think it's so much situation-based. And I know he's being pegged as a lifelong backup and maybe that will be his plight, but maybe he... You know, maybe he is Jameer Nelson, right? Like Jameer Nelson was a four-year player, awesome St. Joe's team, had all these accomplishments, and ended up being a very good NBA point guard for a long time. Yeah, but are you gonna take Jameer Nelson over a swing at a potential guy who could change your franchise? Or a guy Absolutely. Who, that's how these guys get fired, is because they don't take the good players. Some of the guys with that risk also can become Jameer Nelson too, though. You know what I mean? But I'm sure of the one. I'm sure that the one guy is going to be good. And if the guy was going to be such a damn star, why am I taking him at 23? If, if he's going to be such a star, why, am I, why is he available to me at 23? Uh, everybody's scouting evaluations are different. So if a guy's available at 23, your team, you might have that guy ranked eighth on your board. Like he might be eighth on your board, and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter where anybody else has him. If you have him eighth on your board based on your evaluation, what your scouts are saying, what you think in your own evaluation, that's all that matters. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter if he's there because everybody's evaluations are different. Some guys fall in the draft. It just happens. That's how steals are found. There ain't that many. The busts way outweigh. I'm I'm an odds guy, right? So just give me the guy that can play. Yeah, the guys fall. Gobert went 27th. I, I, I had him ranked like 34th because I'm an idiot. <laughs> but, but I had never said, I mean, there was somebody like Gobert. I can't speak to that. I never saw the guy play. I know, but, the, the, but that's almost my, my point is like there's with the, some of these younger guys who fall or these these more mysterious, quote unquote, mysterious players, you know, that come up from overseas, lack of, lack of experience, like Gobert in the drafts, you, you look at his tape overseas. He was somebody who was raw with his movements. He looked clunky on the floor. I don't. I I honestly wondered how much of the appeal with him was just he's a big dude, seven foot one, seven foot nine wingspan, whereas he just didn't know how to play basketball. But he fell into a situation with an incredible player development program. He's learned how to play basketball at a high, high level, and he's displayed the work All ethic. Right, fair of, enough. I mean, like guys fall for a myriad of reasons. And then succeed for them, too. Listen, there's no mysteries to the, guy, the kind of guys I like. I mean, we did this podcast last year, and I told you I like Jordan Bell and I like Sendarius Thornwell. 
and I think they're both better than where they're going to get drafted. And I feel pretty good about that as of today, honestly. Yeah, I feel you. He's, he's got to right? be a good pro. He's got to be a good pro. All right, let's move on to 13 games going on tonight. By virtue oh, of having boy. a national championship game last oh, night, boy. there are 13 games tonight. A couple are massive, one of which is Toronto at Cleveland. Because if we take a quick look at the Eastern Conference, what we find is the Raptors are two games up <laughs> on Boston. Right? They're two games up on Boston. So that is actually in the balance. Who could get the number one seed? And you have this Raptors Cavs game. And how about this? You know what the Raptors next game is after the Cavs? Boston tomorrow night. Boston. Right. So, I mean, we could look up and in two days, it would not be outlandish if in two days, Boston holds on to the number one seed or is at least tied. Crazy. Right. Uh, Record wise. And they would have a tiebreaker if they were to win tomorrow, too. So they would be up top anyway. Now, now you do have to play them at the Raptors, right? If you're Boston. Second night of a back-to-back, though, for Toronto. It's also second night of a back-to-back because Boston has to play Milwaukee tonight. Yes. Right? At Milwaukee. Yep. So you have a lot of these big, big games that are going on tonight. The one, um, because we won't go through all of them, but I will say one of them that is huge. Damn, I thought we were going to do a two-hour podcast. (laughs) We're not. Golden State at Oklahoma City. Okay, is yeah, tonight. Yeah, that's a good one. And the reason that, and this is the TNT game, and the reason that this one is even more important than it would typically be is you have Golden State, who they're locked into the two seed anyway, but they have been putting along here. And Oklahoma City is in a blood war to be able to try to get home court advantage. And they've only got four games left. Pretty much everybody's got five games left, except for Oklahoma City. Minnesota's the other team with four. So Minnesota and Oklahoma City. And listen to Oklahoma City's last four. Man. Golden State at Houston, at Miami, and then the Grizzlies at home on the last game of oh the season. Oh, boy. But there's one <laughs> guaranteed win in there, right, which is the Grizzly game. Well, you never know. When you have never, Golden never State <laughs> at Houston, at Miami. Maybe, maybe, maybe they'll play Marcus Gasol in the fourth quarter. Stop. Game. <laughs> yeah, I, you want to bet? He probably won't even play in the game. He may, he may, he may not even travel to the game. <laughs> he may not even travel to the game <laughs> by the time you get to the last yeah, game of the season. It's like, oh, he missed his flight. Not I know. Make it. The last game of the season, the last home game of the season is on Sunday. He may just stay in his bed from then on. It's like, where did I take? And he just missed his flight and he wasn't able to book a new one. Really? Couldn't make it. Yeah, he's going to have, yeah, have a stomach virus. But anyway, uh, Oklahoma City Golden State is big tonight. We might have. If these teams did hold on to their spots right now, it looks like Portland's pretty safe, honestly. They got five games left, and they're up three on the Spurs. But if the Spurs in Oklahoma City end up four and five, we're going to catch them in the first round. And to me, those are easily the two most dangerous for Houston, wouldn't you say? (laughs) Honestly, like I'm just sitting here, Chris, looking at the standings, and and it's hard to figure out because it is like impossible. We, 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 we've talked about this like so much, and it's like it's been shuffled a hundred times, <laughs> and it's and it's probably gonna be again as shuffled a hundred more times over the last week too. Well, and nobody's got a particularly easy plight the rest oh, of the way. Nobody. And I will say this: so Minnesota is up a half game on the Pelicans, but they're up a game and a half on the Nuggets. It just so happens there are two Timberwolves Nuggets games left. I told you Minnesota's only got four games. Two of them are against the Nuggets. Those become just monster games. Like Denver can honestly, like it's really going to come down to whether or not they beat Minnesota or not. And if they beat Minnesota twice, they're going to have a chance at getting in there. And if they don't, they won't, right? And you yes. even have San Antonio tonight. They're playing the Clippers. I, I mean, Isaac, don't you feel like your Clippers season's on the line tonight? Like they have to win at home against San Antonio to have a shot at this. To be honest, man, it feels like it's already over. Oh, it's over? Okay. Yeah. I'm just looking at the, like the 12, 13 lottery picks. Oh, wow. Because you look at Clippers' schedule right now, what do they have coming up, at Utah. it is not pretty. Yeah, but the last three they could win. They're Nuggets, Pelicans, Lakers all at home. Sure. So they could they go could. four and one. Yeah, but then someone needs, someone still needs to fall. Yeah. Well, I'm saying the Pelicans, they got a game at the Warriors and at the Clippers and the Spurs to close out the season. So, yeah, that matchup between New Orleans and the Clippers. I don't think you're done yet. Big, I but, don't. I don't know. Teo Dosich is out. If you lose tonight, you're done. If you lose to San Antonio. Yeah. I think you're done. But other than that, the Nuggets and the T-Wolves, and those are the two 
and they play two games against each other. I wrote down everybody's schedule, Kevin. I literally have no idea how this is all going to hash itself out. I really don't. I don't either, And they're man. all like half a game, a game and a half away from each other. You look at Minnesota, they've... They've lost one. They're five and five in their last ten. You look at New Orleans. They've lost four in a row. Four and six in their last ten. Both of those teams, at least, you know, statistically, when you look at the remaining strength of schedule, they have the easiest remaining schedule of those teams. But you look at their schedule, and it's like, is it really easy? I mean, New Orleans faces Golden State, San Antonio, and the Clippers, but they have games against Phoenix and Memphis. You look at Minnesota, two games versus yeah. Denver, but they also face the Lakers, who have been quite tough the last couple of months. Granted, they haven't been the last two weeks or so. They've still been tough over a longer period of time. So it's like every single one of these teams has a tough schedule. I think I, I think it's safe to say San Antonio and OKC and Utah are in. It's really that last group of four, I think. Who, if you are Houston, would you want? Who do you want to land in eight? Clippers or Denver. One, I mean, Denver because you can just shred Jokic on defense. Like, he can't stop James Harden mm. or Chris Paul. Um, whereas the Clippers, yeah, actually, I mean, I think Denver's a better team than the Clippers, but... What a great storyline, though. We would get the whole uh, hidden door crap all brought up again, right? Isaac, Chris Paul having to play against the Clippers. No, but Blake's gone. So oh, the yeah, beef is well, gone. Guess, it traveled to yeah. Detroit with him. You think that the, you really think that the rivalry's gone? Yeah. Who else is left on that team that has beef with with Chris Paul? DeAndre. DeAndre that's, don't have beef with yeah. Chris Paul. DeAndre is just like. How about Doc? Oh, that's a good point. Austin. Austin, Austin more than Austin Doc. I think there's still beef. Yeah. Here, but there would still be more tension than if you get a friggin' Houston Nuggets. If you're series. Houston, though, you you're licking your lips if you see Nikola Jokic defending the pick and roll. Yes, like you're gonna slice them apart. Yeah, that would be a rough. Whereas with rough. you know Minnesota, you gotta you know go against you know a handful of talented players. You have you know, mm-hmm. Carl Anthony Towns who can step it up on defense if he wants to. New Orleans, obviously, Anthony Davis. And L.A., he, he, there's DeAndre Jordan. Utah, you have Rudy Gobert. Oklahoma City, it's Steven Adams. A lot, lot of good big defensive bigs. But Denver, oof, nobody's scared of Jokic. He stinks on defense. So we have all of these things still to be hashed out. I, when I wrote down everybody's schedule in both the West and the East, and here was the one that stood out more than any because I was sitting back and I was like, well, hold the phone now. So the M beat injury happened, right? Now, despite that, Philadelphia has still won 10 games in a row. If you look at the standings as of right now, they are in fourth, okay? And they are a half game back from Cleveland. This is the 76ers remaining schedule. Brooklyn at Detroit, Cleveland, Dallas at Atlanta, Milwaukee. That Cleveland game could seriously decide the three seed. Like, it was the first time that I looked at this. I'm like, holy shit, the Sixers could get the three seed. They really can, Kevin. Because the Cavs got the Raptors tonight. And then they play the Wizards. And then that at Philly. Cavs at Philly could very well decide who the three seed is. I can't fathom Philly's that. Philly's got an easy schedule, too. I know. They, that's they, what I just said. Yeah, I mean, it's really easy, too. They got five games left. They're going to be favored in four of those. And the line won't be big in the Sixers Cleveland game. They got six left. So they they got Oh, six games. I'm sorry. Atlanta, Dallas, Brooklyn, Detroit. Right. They could win all four of those. I think you'd look at it right now and go, they're five and one. They're not going to be favored without Embiid against Cleveland. But no. let's say they won that game. I mean, 76 would be the three seed in the Eastern Conference. <laughs> they got a shot at that. They really do. Imagine if they win the final six and they go into the playoffs with a 16-game winning streak. If they oh. win out the rest of the season, 16-game winning streak, surge to the three seed, right? Mm. And Joel Embiid, let's say Joel Embiid comes back for game one of the first round. Suddenly, people are talking about, oh, can the Sixers make it to the NBA Finals? That'll be the conversation we're talking about next Tuesday, if that's the case. Yeah, they wouldn't want to draw Whiteside, though. Because then you'd get the whole white side versus MB. Are you thing. really scared of Hassan Whiteside? I mean, here's what here's what here's what do I'm I say. do. I just not think as much of Hassan Whiteside as others do. I just don't see. I no, don't no, know. no. I'm talking about I'm talking about all that uh, you know. Oh yeah, goofiness yeah, yeah. that goes on between the two. <laughs> and here's the thing. I will tell you. I went through this the orbital bone thing happening to your key player when CJ McCollum uh, trucked Conley and he broke his broke his face. 
And I'm, I'm seeing all of the projections on, Hey, he could come back this fast. He could come. I, I'm telling you, Kevin, like it, you have to wear the mask, obviously, but Mike Conley had no business coming back when he did. And he had the adrenaline, all the adrenaline in the world and helped the Grizzlies get a win on the road at Golden State in game two of that series a couple of years ago. And then he clearly was not himself the rest of the time in that series. And the other thing is that's a perimeter guy. When you're fighting for rebounds with that face mask for on, sure. like I don't, this is, this is not, this is not like, oh, and the projections are great and he's going to be able to be when, the guy's got a damn broken face for God's sakes. <laughs> and, and the swelling has to go down to the point. It's, it's hard to get the swelling down to the point where a mask will fit correctly. And then these guys hate those masks, right? And it's covering what is still a tender, uh, you know, a tender head because you're, <laughs> you're not fully healed by the time you're coming back usually. And now you're going to be in the mix. You're going to be down in the post. Eesh. I worry about that with Embiid. I do because I I want so badly to see him be able to perform on the playoffs as Joel Embiid and playing every night. But uh, just knowing what that was like, I was around uh, Conley during that time when 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 that happened to Embiid. I was like, oh god, no, because that is that injury is a bitch <laughs> and hard to come back from. It is. I just hope we get to see him wear goggles. Like, like he did at Kansas when he had an eye injury there. It was a good look. Right. Well, here's the thing that sucks, and I hate to put a damper on this. You know, and much like every year, things can be altered. Whatever eventually happens in these NBA playoffs can be altered by injury. Yeah. But this year, you're talking about, I mean, Kyrie had a procedure done, right? And so we have no idea what he's going to be. There's, We're now five games left in the season, Kevin, and we have no idea if we're going to see Jimmy Butler or Kawhi Leonard. And then Embiid broke his eyeball. And then John Wall <laughs> appears to be okay, you know, uh, as he is as he is coming back. For what it's worth, I, I do think we're going to get Butler back. Ye- yesterday, there's a report that he started play, uh, practicing in five-on-fives, and it sounds like he will come back before the end of the regular season, or he'll at least be back for the playoffs. Um, so that's really good news for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Well, and then we have obviously the Curry thing hanging out there. Yep. His timetable was three weeks from March 24th, but he had a grade two MCL sprain, right? And I saw where Kevin Pelton uh, added this note. He said, players have not shot as well from three point range after returning from grade two MCL sprains as expected. Curry was, in fact, less accurate on threes in the 2016 playoffs, shooting 40% after compared to 45% during the regular season. But the larger issue was inside the arc. He shot 57% yep. on twos during the regular season and just 49% during the playoffs. And he says, obviously, every player, every injury is unique. But that was at least what we went through with Curry last time around. For sure. And, you know, that was a that was a topic in my article last week on Curry, like the ripple mm-hmm. effects of, for the injury. And, it, and it's the type of thing where, yes, like as Kevin Pelton put in his article, you know, his three point shooting, three point shooting numbers were down a little bit, but it was the at rim stuff that really hurt him. And there, I think one of the reasons why is because when he returned in the 2016 finals that year, a little bit of his quickness was gone. That burst that makes him so exceptional at creating his shot off the dribble. And if that's not there, that'll be concerning. But the thing is, is it's not just the knee injury either. He's sprained his ankle like a thousand times this season. Mm-hmm. So there's always a risk for re-injury as well, where it's like, yeah, you might get him back, but he also needs to stay on the floor. And there's no guarantee for that to happen when he himself has said his ankles aren't going to get 100% until the offseason when he has a long period of rest. So he said that before he, he, had, he sprained the MCL. It's the type of thing where there's multiple concerns with Stephen Curry. Well, and the concern is so great that one of the online sports books yesterday, Bavada put out odds, and for the first time in, God, I don't know, years, the Rockets were right there with the Warriors at the top of the odds. Like, if you wanted to go and you wanted to bet it, for the first time, you would be able to bet it, and the odds-on favorite was not Golden State. And usually, they've been the favorite by a mile, and in fact, they've got the same odds as the Rockets right now. If you were if you were setting odds, do you look at it right now and say the Warriors still have to be the favorite, or do you look at it now and think the Rockets should be 
Houston is, in my opinion, and it's simply because of the health, right? I, I think with Steph, there's that big question hanging over them. Um, Houston is fantastic on both ends of the floor, and Golden State's best player is out, and we don't know when he'll be back. In the East? In the East? Favorite there? What do you think? It's Cleveland. LeBron. You do. Because they have LeBron yeah, Just James. until somebody beats him, yeah. until somebody beats him, you cannot... I know they are the favorite. I'm asking you, do you think they should be the favorite? Well, yes, and that was, that was what I wrote about yesterday, where it's the type of thing where LeBron is the favorite because he's LeBron. The Cavaliers are the favorite because they have LeBron James. Every other team, there's questions. You just hit on it earlier. Boston, Kyrie's out. Philly, Joel Embiid's out. Toronto, they their defense has been really, really shaky the last three-ish weeks. Indiana, they're really, really good, and they've played Cleveland really tough this year. Um, and I think they could make it a tougher series than people think, but they need Oladipo to be unbelievable, too, I think, really, to beat Cleveland and LeBron. With the Wizards, John Wall just came back. Will he get back to the same level? Will he be? Will he incorporate himself into their offense? We'll see. Miami, I don't, I, I don't view them as a team that could really beat Cleveland over a seven-game series, but they could, again, play them tough. I think they would need a lot of luck to go in their way. And then Milwaukee... The defense just isn't good enough. And I think Giannis is maybe a year or two away from being able to take down LeBron. This will be a little bit of a preview, though, tonight, because we do get Toronto at Cleveland, right? You know that with this amount of time left in the... uh, This is going to play out, maybe not necessarily like a playoff game, but as close as we can get to in the regular season, because both of these teams will want to make some level of a lasting impression on the other. Right, because we're going to get to see them for the last time. Toronto on the road at Cleveland tonight um, are playing each other. Same goes with Golden State, Oklahoma City. And I know Golden State's hobbled right now, but you know Oklahoma City is going to attempt to make a statement against them tonight. I mean, these games, we might have had an off night last night, but these games tonight are loaded with the ability to overreact. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> right, like we're gonna be, we're gonna watch these, yeah. and it's gonna take everything we can not to overreact to what we see. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping my my internet and modem gets fixed so I can actually watch these games tonight. But what? We'll see. Yeah, yeah, right, oh, right, no. right, right now, right now, no TV again. But yeah, t- tonight's game, Tor- Toronto, Cleveland, uh, especially with the way the last one went, Chris. Right? Yes. With Toronto putting 79 points on Cleveland in the first half, but then Cleveland just utterly dominating in the second half. Storming back, winning that game 132 to 129. I wonder if we'll get another high scoring affair or if Toronto, after a little a day off, or a couple of days off, they fix their defense and really get back into the rhythm that they were in earlier in the season. Because they've been, they, I don't want to say they've been torched, but they've been really, really shaky on that end of the floor the last couple of weeks. And it, it's concerning for me um, heading into the playoffs. It's just a bad time. It's a really bad timing. I I wonder if they peak too soon. Okay. One of the teams, right, that is in there that like keeps getting skipped over. And I find it super interesting because I I know that in between uh, Bill and yourself, right, you guys are very keenly aware of the Celtics levels of success or failure throughout the season. You're keeping up with them because that's the hometown team. That being said, they have won six games in a row. They still have a chance at the number one seed. We don't know what level of Kyrie Irving comes back, but it does feel like everybody has thrown dirt on them. Have you? No, but they need Kyrie back. I mean, they they need their end game go to fourth quarter scoring bucket getter. (laughs) They they need Kyrie. You know what they're doing in the playoffs is right now. What they're doing right now in the regular season is sweet. It's really nice to watch. You know, seeing a guy like. Shemi Ojale play a good 20 minutes per game, seeing Terry Rozier get buckets over 35 minutes. That's really nice, but they need Kyrie Irving to elevate in the playoffs. What's what's been most amazing to watch is just the progress of Jason Tatum. It's remarkable. Early earlier in the season, obviously he's putting up numbers and then he kind of hit the wall towards the middle of the season in January, but Last couple of weeks with Kyrie Irving out, they've really tailored the offense a lot more towards him, putting him in more pick and rolls and more dribble handoff actions, and he is just excelling at a high level. Um, and, and if there's any reason for optimism for the Celtics in the playoffs, it's the fact that they don't just have one go-to scorer in Kyrie Irving. They would have two with Kyrie Irving and Jason Tatum. Um, he's, he's really elevated his play in recent weeks. It's been amazing to watch him. Could you foresee a circumstance where Jason Tatum is the best player on a championship caliber team? Yeah. 
You could. Yep. You think he is going to be that level of of a great player? Yeah. Loved him in the draft last year. Had him second right behind that? Markel Fultz. Do you think Jason Tatum can have a better career than Carmelo Anthony? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's the highest. Hold on. Bar. Don't, don't, don't just, don't just, don't just slough that off. Right. Yeah. Of course you can. I mean, Carmelo's like a damn 10 time all star. I know Kevin. he is. I know, I know, <laughs> I, mean, I know he is. I know. I, I, and, I, and Carmelo is, is a great player, a Hall of Famer because of his numbers. But the thing is, is he's always been a, a low impact playmaker, low impact defender. Two important key categories when it comes to winning basketball. <laughs> oh, man. Feel like you're kind of slandering it, and we don't know what level Jason Tatum will reach. It might I mean, be a little early on Tatum, right? It might be a little early to decide that. No, what do you mean? <laughs> that the guy's going to be a Hall of Famer? I'm not saying he'll be a Hall of Famer. <laughs> well, you just said he could be better, Carmelo Anthony. Carmelo Anthony's a Hall. I of don't Famer. know if he will be better, but he could be better. That was the question. Will Will he be better? I don't know. I can't predict the future, but the ingredients are there for him to have a highly successful career over an extended period of time. He, he's a fantastic go to scorer. Uh, his at 19 years old, as well, actually going back to last year, Duke, his his fluidity on the floor is really unusual for a teenager. And now at 20, he's only gotten better. I think if you're projecting ahead, there's certainly a chance that he could have a remarkable career. It uh, doesn't mean he will. Like he might plateau and never get better than what he is in a year or two. He might he might top out at like a 20 point per game guy, but he might not either. I'm glad you brought up that you cannot predict the future because it is the greatest difference between you and I. I can. You can see it's true. You can. <laughs> Bruno Damas. <laughs> Bruno Damas says. Um, <laughs> Who's going to win the finals, Chris? The NBA finals? Yeah. What pick are the Grizzlies going to have, and who are they going to pick? They will have the number two pick, and they will take Marvin Bagley. Oh, I thought you were going to say DeAndre Ayton. <laughs> oh, good grief. <laughs> You don't predict your own personal nightmares. Don't put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> don't put that evil on me. <laughs> here's, here, here's the thing. If I had to pick right now, honestly, all grouping aside, <laughs> I would still pick the Warriors. Okay, that's fair. And I would yeah. bank on Steph being able to come back. Because the last time we saw, you remember, banged up Steph? We do need to keep this in mind. Still pretty awesome. No, Kevin Durant wasn't on the team. Yeah, yeah. Good, good point. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was actually punitive yeah. that he was hurt. And, and, that, right? and, and that's, like, that's the funny thing. It's like, it's like we talk about, like, like in my article I wrote about it, you mentioned it with Kevin Pelton's stats. Like, Steph shot 41% after coming back from his knee injury. It's like, really? Is that, is that a bad thing? <laughs> yeah, like, right. it's like he's still pretty amazing, even at well, 80% or whatever. whatever that's it is. what we need to remember. They did sign <laughs> Kevin Durant to play on their team yeah. since we have seen that and honestly before they had Kevin Durant they would have won that title if Draymond doesn't kick LeBron in the dick yeah, no kidding you know <laughs> so I mean uh, it's not like oh god Steph Curry went down oh well, like you, have, <laughs> you have the second best player in the world who are we gonna turn to yeah <laughs> <laughs> right like th- at that point it was like oh hope we can get more than what we expected out of Sean Livingston now they now, now they got Quinn Cook they got Quinn Cook Quinn now. Cook, yeah. He's getting buckets, dude. Quinn Cooks, he's been doing well. Yeah. <laughs> and, by it's, the way, another four watch. another four year college player that people passed on. Yeah, sure. But are you never mind. He's, telling you he's pretty good. Yeah, but are you gonna draft pretty Quinn good. Cook? Terry Rozier too. He was in the twenty fifteen draft. Are you gonna are you gonna Who? draft Quinn Cook Quinn? and wait three years for him to turn into an NBA player? He's 25. Some of these guys, it takes a while. Come yeah, on, he's man. A, he's, a, he's a career backup. Where was he taken? He was undrafted, as he should have been. He's undrafted? And so was Fred Van Vliet. You didn't want Fred Van Vliet on your team. Yeah, there's been a lot of good undrafted players. And Van Vliet probably should I'm have been drafted. At the, hey, hold on now. Hold on now. I just pulled up the top, uh, the 2015 second uh, round. I know what you're going to do. I know. <laughs> There's 27 of these guys I I've never know, even heard of. <laughs> I know. There's 27 of them. Oh, here's Rashawn Holmes. And, and look, <laughs> and this is me really nerding out, but the reason why some of these guys get drafted is because it's a draft and stash. They don't have a roster spot, and so they take a guy that they can stash in the G League or somewhere overseas and just hold his rights, whereas sometimes, and I'm not saying this was the case with Quinn Cook, but it might have been because it is for some players where their agent or their circle insists that they sign a contract and that they're on their NBA roster. Mm-hmm. And so some of those guys that would have gotten drafted end up going undrafted 
because they want, in a sense, that they want to have the freedom of choosing where to go. Just let me tell you, on that on that 2015 draft, since you brought it up, this will be the last thing. <sighs> okay. You look at the names I've heard of. Montrez Harrell, Jr., Rashawn Holmes, Sr., Josh Richardson, Sr., Pat Cahotton, Sr., like every friggin' guy that got drafted, at Norman Powell, Sr., Every single guy was these old guys that Kevin O'Connor shits on. What are you talking about? <laughs> I like Pat Connor, but I, I had Josh Richardson ranked like 22nd. I, I, I missed a lot of dudes. I'm just busting your job. I, I'm busting I, your I job. nailed it with Josh Richardson, baby. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. You, na- you nailed Josh Richardson. But, but he was one of my sleepers. You nailed He was one of my sleepers. I'd missed on Anthony Brown. Anthony Brown, I had him ranked like 25 and. I, I'm blaming Tibbs because Anthony Brown is the, the two way guy Brown, on, the, huh? on the Minnesota Timberwolves, and he hasn't gotten a minute, even though he's killing it in the G League. So I'm going to blame Tibbs for just not playing Anthony Brown. Hopefully next year, Anthony gets an opportunity. Yeah, he just got a bad. <laughs> he was just in a bad spot, yeah. right? It's just just going to blame Tibbs spot. for all, all life's problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know what uh, Tibbs has got a lot of stuff to worry about because he's got those last two games it is actually not until Thursday night so it'll be Thursday at Denver Thursday night who would have ever guessed that Minnesota and Denver on Thursday night God I wish Denver still I mean listen I wish Minnesota still had Jimmy Butler and I wish Denver still had Gary Harris we'll see what happens at Denver on Thursday but this is a schedule bitch they play at Denver Thursday night, and then they fly, and they got to go play the Lakers on Friday. Mm. I get that the Lakers is not the worst thing ever, but the, the whole Denver travel thing is hard anyway, right? Because you are you got the time change, you got the altitude change, and then you're playing a back-to-back, and you're going to L.A. Most of the guys all go out the second they get off the plane in L.A. Maybe, maybe Tibbs will be able to convince them not to. So now, listen, here's what we know. <laughs> that, that Thursday night Denver game – matters so much that they will have just played uh, 52 minutes each in high altitude. <laughs> <laughs> and then they got to turn around and play the next night oh, in Los man. Angeles. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. At least they have that Memphis game. At least they have that going for them. What do you mean? The Grizzlies own the Timberwolves. It's the only game on the road they won the whole damn year. <laughs> Four in a row, five of six against the Timberwolves. You could talk about any other team, but don't you talk to me about the Timberwolves. The Grizzlies own them. Memphis has five remaining games at New Orleans, Sacramento, Detroit, at Minnesota, at Oklahoma City. Besides the Sacramento and Detroit games, are they going to win any of those three games against New Orleans, Minnesota, or OKC? Are they going to pull any of those out? Are they going to disappoint a fan base, Chris? No, No, they're going to lose all three? If they win, they'll disappoint their own. (laughs) So no. <laughs> so no. <laughs> They're worried about their own fan base at this point. <laughs> I mean, once you're once you're in yeah. the bucket, you're in the bucket, yeah. right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. The, the 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 best is gonna. Hey, the best is gonna be. You may see. You know, at the on Friday night, uh, flip on the Grizzly Sacramento. It's Dave Yeager, who's the former coach of the Grizzlies, right? You know he'd love to screw it over. They're in the lottery mix, too. You may see in the fourth quarter of that game every player <laughs> sitting on the ground, like just sitting on the ground and refusing to <laughs> to score. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, maybe uh, maybe Zebo in his second return to Memphis will try to go for 40 points or something. I'm excited for the tank race. I'm as excited oh, for the tank race as I am for... The NBA playoff race. Um, well, it's, you don't have to. Go, you don't have to go watch it in person every night. I don't know, trust man. Me, you wouldn't be as excited if you did. <laughs> it's funner to read the box score than sit in the arena. Trust me. I love hope, though, and sometimes it's fun to root for your team to lose if it's all in the, if it's all in the means of building towards winning. You know what I mean? Like, is, is there's a little bit of fun in that when the games are close and you're rooting for the team to lose. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a good time. I'm not wired that way. Me and Jim, it's, me it's and Jim Moore. I'm gonna call up. I'm gonna call up Jim Moore, and we're gonna bitch about millennials. What was it Herm Edwards? Was it Herm Edwards who says you play to win the game? That was Herm that's Edwards, right. right? Play yeah. to win the game. Yeah, you play to win the game. Yeah, but you also can play to win the long game too, and that's by having a higher draft pick and increasing your odds of drafting a superstar, Chris, like DeAndre well, Ayton. You and <laughs> you and you and uh, GM McDonough from Phoenix can go sit around and have a powwow <laughs> about how fun about how fun that is. <laughs> it's a blast. Yeah, you know what? Look at Phoenix this year. I love what they're doing. They've lost fifteen in a row, just like they should be. 
They have a tons of cap space, tons of assets and yeah. draft picks. They have a superstar in Devin Booker, and they have an opportunity to draft another one this year. They could be looking pretty damn good in a couple of seasons. Will McDonough be the GM at that time? Well, we'll see if Robert Sarver is that patient, but the team could be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll wait for it. I'll be there waiting for when who, it comes around. Who, Kev. Knows, who knows, Chris? Maybe, maybe Memphis and Phoenix will both draft their franchise-changing players in this year's draft, and you guys will be meeting in the Western Conference Finals in four years. You never know. You never know. Franchise changing. You never know, though, Chris. I don't think these guys are franchise changing this year. But, I don't. But they could be. Yeah, well, maybe I can grow six eight. Maybe I could. Maybe, Kev. maybe. You never know. With modern science. You never know. Something could come out <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> I'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Kev. Have a good one, Chris. It's going to do it for another Ringer NBA show. If you dig what you're hearing, go give us a rating and review on iTunes. We will talk to you next week. Hey!